So glad to see you all here celebrating this wonderful Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. week. Um, my name is Elizabeth Cronk Warner, and my pronouns are she and hers. And it is an absolute privilege to be here with you today. As I like to do any time that we gather, I do want to acknowledge that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. And what a better community outreach activity um, than having the amazing the phenomenal um, professor and dean, Jamila Jefferson Jones. Um, one of the great things about being um, at this university is the opportunity to have thought leaders not only here as our faculty and staff, but also to invite um, them to campus. And Professor and Dean uh, Jamila jo Jefferson Jones is exactly one of those individuals. Um, I'm sure that you are going to just absolutely love her presentation today. So she is currently on faculty at the University of Kansas School of Law, and she is both a professor of law and she is the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And I should note, not just a professor of law, a named professor of law. She is the Earl B. Schultz Research Professor of Law. Um, and she really takes an interesting look at racialized identities in the United States and looks at them through a lens of property, um, which is she, what she's going to be talking about today. Um, her article that she wrote, Living While Black, Blackness is Nuisance, was actually highlighted um, not only in um, a law journal, the American University Law Review, but it was also featured in the New York Times. So I'm really excited that she, yes, yes, I'm really excited that she had time today to come and share her wisdom with us today. Um, so she is a graduate of the Harvard Law School and Harvard College. And prior to her career in the academy, um, she practiced law for over a decade in firms in the District of Columbia and her hometown of New Orleans. Um, so with that, please join me in welcoming the fabulous, the amazing Professor Jamila Jefferson Jones. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me here today. I am so grateful to be one of the University of Utah's MLK Week speakers and the speaker here at the law school. I truly, truly appreciate the opportunity to share my scholarship with this community and I'm grateful to my former colleague, friend, and sister, Dean Elizabeth Cronk Warner, for the invitation. My talk today is entitled Living While Black, Blackness as Nuisance and the Racialization of Space. And this title, including the hashtag, reflects a strand of my research that engages critical race methodologies, to interrogate the ways in which those that have been racialized as white seek to exclude those who have been racialized as black from public and private spaces, particularly through the use or threat of state-sanctioned violence, um, both that engaged in by private parties and violence perpetuated by police action. In 2020, uh, Professor Tajania Henderson of Rutgers and I published hashtag living while black, blackness as nuisance in the American Law Review, American University Law Review. And in that article, we examined a slew of 20, 20, 2018 and 2019 incidents in which white people called the police on black people who were engaged in everyday activities. 
And while most commentators saw these incidents as criminal justice issues, we also saw property law issues. So in our article, we worked to bridge the gap between criminal law and property law by examining how these complaints in what we called living while black incidents deploy the language of land use, particularly trespass and nuisance to provoke state violence with the aim of excluding black people from shared space. This work is relevant to the ongoing struggle for civil rights and to the continued legacy of Dr. King. One hallmark of the civil rights movement was black folks' fight for entree into every corner of American public life. This was often contested with regard to the right to use and enjoy physical spaces, whether those spaces were bus seats, lunch counters, schools, or even entire neighborhoods. And the tool that was often employed to bar black people from spaces was state-supported violence, either the violence of private actors endorsed or ignored by the state, or the violence of state actors in the guise of law enforcement agencies. But as I mentioned, Professor Henderson and I studied incidents that started in 2018, long after the civil rights movement. Yet, these were still concerned, we were still concerned with the phenomenon of black exclusion through the use of state-sanctioned violence. This is why critical race theory and critical, critical race methodologies have been essential to my work. One of the questions raised by CRT when it was initially, initially developed in the 1970s was, why aren't all of the promises of the civil rights movement being fulfilled? Why was the segregation and racial disadvantage still so prevalent? Thus, this method of inquiry in the words of two of its early theorists, Professor Richard Delgado and James Stefanik, became concerned with study, studying and transforming the relationship among race, racism, and power. Delgado and Stefanik go on to say that CRT considers the same issues that conventional civil rights and ethnic studies discourses consider, but places them in a broader perspective that includes economics, history, context, group and self-interest, and even feelings and the unconscious. Further, whereas the traditional civil rights embraces incrementalism and step-by-step -step progress, critical race theory questions the foundations and, and structures of American life. This, in many ways, reflects the work that Dr. King had started at the end of his life through the Poor People's Campaign which, as the King Center notes, was seen by King as the next chapter in the struggle for genuine equality. They go on to say that des desegregation and the right to vote were essential, but King believed that African Americans and other minorities would never enter full citizenship until they had economic security. Now, I just trans tr transitioned from space to economic security. One of the results of spatial racialization is ghettoization of minorities to consign them to their place. And in doing so, this restricts their life choices and outcomes, which in turn stifles their economic security. So the fight for equal opportunity in the use and enjoyment of what should be shared spaces is spatial, but it is also psychic and economic. So what does it mean for space to be racialized? Property is racialized when it is ascribed a racial identity or character that includes some and excludes others on the basis of race. Those spaces can be neighborhoods, public parks, stores, streets, hotels. Spaces are racialized by the people who use and lay claim to them. The central principle of racial territoriality, which was coined by Professor Elise Body, is that what should be shared space 
is being wrongfully claimed in the name of racial exclusion and the interests of white supremacy. In 2018 alone, one CNN report noted that police had been called on African Americans for operating a lemonade store, golfing too slowly, waiting for friends at Starbucks, barbecuing at a park, working out at a gym, campaigning door to door, moving into an apartment, mowing the wrong lawn, shopping for prom clothes, napping in a university common room, asking for directions, not waving while leaving an Airbnb, redeeming a coupon, selling bottled water on a sidewalk, eating lunch on a college campus, riding in a car with a white grandmother, babysitting two white children, wearing a backpack that brushed against a woman, working as a home inspector, working as a firefighter, helping a homeless man, delivering newspapers, swimming in a pool, shopping while pregnant, driving with leaves on a car, trying to cash a paycheck, walking while black, swimming while black, studying while black, hanging out in a cafe, Starbucks, while black, driving while black, and having the police called to remove you from spaces in which you are merely existing, that is living while black. By modest estimates, the term living while black has been used on social media to describe these experiences hundreds of thousands, if not millions of times. Since the 2018 Starbucks incident in Philadelphia, which I will discuss, we've been researching this phenomenon and seeking answers for, for the for questions such as whose rights and which of those rights ought the law and law enforcement seek to protect in these living while black incidents? And what remedies ought to be available to those whose rights are violated? The social media hashtag living while black is a play on an older term, driving while black which euphemistically describes the violence of racial profiling of black drivers by law enforcement. Living While Black first appeared as a social media hashtag to mobilize attention to incidents where white people called the police on black people for engaging in non-criminal everyday activities. While the term living while black had been previously used to describe the fraught conditions of navigating racist encounters for black people, the hashtag via high quality cell phone video and the use of social media brought this term into the nation's common lexicon. What's different about the modern rise in living while black incidents is that cell phone technology has put high quality video production and distribution in the hands of the masses. Everyone is able to use this ostensibly objective medium to validate their witness to abuses, whether to the circumstances prompting false 911 calls or to police violence. The ubiquity of, cell, of the cell phone does make it easier for racists to call the police quickly, but I think that this is outweighed by the benefit that victims and bystanders are able to reap. Cell phone video corroborates what had previously been dismissed as unreliable or merely anecdotal. Everyone is now a film producer. But what's different from earlier eras is the, the policing of black people within public and private spaces and the use of law enforcement. What's not different, I'm sorry, from earlier eras is the policing of black people in public and private spaces and the use of law enforcement as tools of racist exclusion. So the new piece is the cell phone and the video, but the exclusion has been ongoing. While the popular narrative about these incidents is justifiably influenced by concerns about criminal justice policy and high profile police shootings of unarmed civilians, another er element to the hashtag living while black phenomenon caught our attention. The 911 callers 
requesting police intervention to remove or detain the black targets of such claims were not merely relying upon criminal law concepts to articulate their claims of imminent harm. These callers were also using property law concepts, particularly trespass and nuisance, to invoke the intervention and assistance of law enforcement. This phenomenon is firmly grounded in property and its racialization, an insight that is explored in our article. The screenshot here, the one that we have up here, is from video taken by a bystander at Starbucks in Center City, Philadelphia in April 2018. The cafe manager telephoned 911 to report that two men had entered the store and were not buying anything. At first glance, the call seemed to be a run-of-the-mill private trespass, whereby a commercial establishment might seek police intervention to remove persons thought to be disruptive or violent. In this case, however, neither condition was present. The two men who were targeted by this manager had entered the store less than two minutes before she called the police. Video shows that the men sat at a table, as people sometimes do when they enter Starbucks, and began chatting together. Less than two minutes later, the police were called. When police arrived, the two men were arrested for trespass. Video of the arrest, with the men being accosted in the store and let out in handcuffs, circulated on social media often with that hashtag, living while black. The viral video sparked massive public calls for a boycott of Starbucks due to the perceived racist actions of this store manager. Starbucks responded to the growing public pressure by closing all of its stores in late May for a day-long training. That, for us, was the beginning but our research showed that Starbucks was merely a modern instance of a much older pattern. Although the moniker is new, as is the dissemination of these living while black incidents via cell phone footage and social media, living while black and blackness as nuisance clashes themselves are not new. In fact, such encounters between and among black and non-black neighbors have long been the subject of civil litigation. Commencing in the years following Reconstruction, white litigants began pursuing property law claims sounding in nuisance in an attempt to police and arrest black proximity. We see in the earliest of these an effort by white litigants to cast black people and their nearness as property harms deserving of legal protection. And what we, freak, and what we see, interestingly enough, is that in each of these cases, even while courts frequently accepted as valid the social undesirability of black proximity, that presumptive undesirability did not result in the granting of a remedy at law. This was a surprise to us in our, um, in our research. Even as these Jim Crow era judges explicitly admitted racial bias and struggled to reconcile their personal social preferences with the ostensibly race neutral common law of nuisance, in decision after decision, we see judges rejecting claims for property relief. For example, in 1882, James Falloon, an attorney in Hiawatha, Kansas, brought suit against his neighbor, Adam Schilling, claiming that Schilling's construction of tenement houses along the lot line shared with Falloon's property was a nuisance solely because the tenants were black. In a clear nod to the social construction of whiteness, 
Falloon included in his pleadings that he and his family did in no manner associate themselves with colored people, he and his family being white people. According to the court, the allegation that Schilling leased the tenement to persons the plaintiff termed worthless Negroes was unavailing in this nuisance action for two reasons. First, because as the court uncritically noted, the tenants inclu included a minister and his family and therefore were not worthless Negroes. Second, the court noted that a Negro family is not per se a nuisance. As long as that neighbor's family is well behaved, it matters not what the color, race, or habits may be, or how offensive personally or socially it may be to, a, to the plaintiff. Plaintiff has no cause of complaint in the courts. So we can see that while the social media and public conversation um, that we've been examining emerged only in the past few years, racial territoriality is not new. These ideas date back, um, date as far back as the founding of the country, and racial lines were hardened during Jim Crow. Emancipation, as noted by scholars including W.E.B. Du Bois, did not lead to freedom. So let's move forward in time. With the exception of the Starbucks incident, perhaps the most notorious living while black incident of 2018 occurred in Oakland, California, along the shores of the city's Lake Merritt. We see in both the April incident at Lake Merritt and then a June incident across the bridge in San Francisco, um, so we have uh, these folk earned themselves some new monikers, Barbecue Becky and Permit Patty, um, in uh, San Francisco. The leveraging, um, in this case by white women specifically, of racist tropes around black predation and violence and white female vulnerability. In both cases, these women used the mechanism of 911 emergency services to craft narratives of victimhood and heroism in the face of threats to the public. In Schulte's case, um, our barbecue Becky, she claimed that there were wayward barbecue coals and therefore these black men who were barbecuing in the park should be arrested. Um, in Edel's case, uh, Permit Patty, she claimed that there was irksome noise, but she, she was going to, or she did call the police on a child, a black child who was selling water on the sidewalk. This imagined public is one that is exclusive though. It does not include black men, women, and children. When initially confronted about her choice to call Oakland police to report the Merritt Park barbecuers, Jennifer Schulte displayed steadfastness in the face of her critics, refusing to yield or end her call. Seconds later, once connected with the 911 dispatcher, Schulte began to cry and claimed to have been harassed. Once the dispatched police officer arrived on the scene, Schulte began crying so much so that she was initially unable to communicate with the officers at the scene. Having aggressively and unilaterally initiated a confrontation with the barbecuers and having threatened, y'all are going to jail, it was only when she had the attention of the police and emergency personnel that Schulte claimed to be a victim of others' aggression. In doing so, she strategically tapped into the long history in this country of white fears of black male predators. Variations on this duo of discursive strategies 
recur in several of these living while black incidents cataloged in our research. These tropes are antithetical to integration and together support the establishment or maintenance of exclusively white spaces under the protection of public law enforcement. Now, to his credit and to, more importantly, to the dispatcher's credit, the dispatcher knew something was wrong, um, told the police officer who was arriving at the scene, and so he was on his guard, asked a number of questions, um, and ended up diffusing the scene, but it does not always go that way. On May 25th of 2020, Amy Cooper called 911 on Christian Cooper, a black bird watcher in New York City's Central Park. When he had admonished her about violating the park's dog leash rules, rather than simply complying with the rule or taking her dog to an unrestricted area, she called 911 and deployed racist ideas about black men to communicate to the dispatcher that Mr. Cooper was a threat. In fact, before she called 911, she told Mr. Cooper that she was going to leverage racist tropes to summon police, making sure that she emphasized that an African-American man was threatening her and her dog. Her intention was to signal to the dispatcher that Christian Cooper's race alone made him a threat worthy of swift police response. It came to light soon thereafter that Amy Cooper had a second previously unreported conversation with a 911 dispatcher in which she falsely claimed that Christian Cooper tried to assault her thus ratcheting up her claim of black male violence and further in endangering Christian Cooper's life. On the same day, May 20th, 2020, that Amy Cooper in New York wielded white womanhood and white tears and threatened Christian Cooper's life with her ability to call forth state violence, George Floyd was being murdered in Minneapolis. His death, a recorded example of state violence exacting the ultimate price from black bodies when called upon even for minor criminal enforcement. If George Floyd could be executed for allegedly passing a counterfeit bill, then certainly Christian Cooper could end up dead for having asserted himself in a space claimed by whiteness. Some states and cities have enacted laws um, that punish perpetrators of these living while black abuses. A couple of years ago, the city of Grand Rapids, Michigan passed a human rights ordinance that prohibits crime reporting based upon, among other things, an individual's actual or perceived color or race. Such biased crime reporting may result in prosecution for a municipal civil infraction and is punishable by a modest fine in addition to costs, damages, expenses, and sanctions. Also, a couple of years ago, Oregon enacted legislation that allows targets of living while black calls to sue those who initiate such calls for civil damages up to $250. In the wake of the incident in Central Park, a bill was introduced into the New York State Assembly. Um, it had been previously introduced, but it gained new life. It was already illegal in New York to make a false 911 call. The new bill Makes, a hate, makes it a hate crime to call 911 and make a false accusation of criminal activity based on race, gender, or religion. 
In addition to statutory remedies, there have been calls to better train 911 dispatchers so that they ask questions aimed at rooting out bias rather than unquestioningly sending officers to the scene. Finally, police must also be better trained to respond to instances that may be living while black occurrences and to better protect the victims of such false reporting. But are these efforts enough? When and how did the failure of white litigants like Falloon, their failure to secure relief from the court, morph into the obvious success of bringing the full weight of law enforcement on individuals who are living while black? And what would it take to massively reduce police response to nuisance calls to begin with? If property law is truly foundational to all that we live and breathe, something that I as a property law professor and scholar actually do believe, where does that leave us? Can racial justice fundamentally coexist with property rights in this country? This brings me back to the University of Utah's MLK Week theme, choose love over hate. Part of loving is including. As my co-author, Professor Tajania Henderson has written, if black lives matter, then black living must also matter. So I charge you with that in choosing love over hate to choose to enhance black living. Thank you. That was amazing, Dean Jefferson Jones. Um, so now we have an opportunity to um, ask uh, Dean Jefferson Jones some questions. Um, we're doing that via Slido because we have um, several folks. This is a hybrid event. So we have folks who are online and who are both here in the room. Um, if you haven't used Slido before, the directions are here on the screen. You can go to slido.com. And then if you enter the code hashtag living well black, um, it goes to my fancy screen here, um, and I can go ahead and ask uh, the questions of Dean Jefferson Jones. Um, so while we're giving folks some time to enter their questions and ask, um, Dean Jefferson Jones, what do you think the solution is? Can we live with the existing common law, uh, which tends to be race neutral when we're talking about trespass and nuisance? Or do you think we need to enact something along the lines of what you're talking about in New York that specifically talks about um, racialized identities? Both. So we need um, the common law to keep up the work that it has done, right? Which has already said and has never been overturned that proximity, that you, the fact that you just don't like a certain group um, does not constitute nuisance. And there's no claim, there's no, no legal remedy there for those bringing those claims. However, um, these various acts, and some of them have been called Karen Acts, I can't remember what the Karen stands for, and it's spelled with a C. Um, these acts need more teeth. So I mentioned, you know, a $250 civil, civil fine. Mm. Um, is that going to deter the actions? Um, now, there have been, of course, there's the kind of swift action of the public um, in making these, these incidents go viral. Folks lose their livelihood because of it. Um, but there ought to also be other sanctions that will be truly um, deterring in their effect. One of the um, one of the tensions that I feel as someone who does not believe in the continued pro proliferation of criminal sanctions generally is that on the one hand, there's a part of me that says they should be punished more heavily and there should be criminal sanctions. Um, that's the, uh, the retributionist in me. But that goes against my, my own values of decreasing the carceral state. Um, and so the question is, how do we find that balance? How do we find the right 
punishment for those who engage in this sort of behavior. Wonderful. And we noted at the beginning of your presentation that this was highlighted in the New York Times. I have to imagine that you, you received some feedback on that. I'd be interested, uh, what, if anything, have, have folks said in response? What's crazy is I didn't get any hate mail. You know, you get the hate email and all that stuff. I Well, okay, that's not quite true. Um, it's not from the New York Times, though, not from that. Um, there is one of the case studies that we mention in our paper, um, the incident that happened at Yale. And at Yale, um, an African-American, um, well, actually she's African, a black woman, grad student, who lived in a graduate dorm, had the Yale uh, University police called on her by a white grad student because she was sleeping in the common room, um, which is one of the things people do in dorm common rooms. Study, fall asleep, fall asleep, study, eat whatever, take naps. Um, and so we wrote about this. I mean, it's, you know, you can Google it, it's there. Um, and the woman who called the police on the sleeping black grad student has um, stalked me a little on Twitter. <laughs> so there's been a little bit of that, but that's the only one. Haven't gotten any bad, any um, negative pushback. Um, and this has been received pretty positively. As it should be. So that's wonderful to hear. Um, so our first question from Slido asks, what could restorative justice solutions look like as opposed to retrib uh, retributive punishments? That's a good question. Um, they could look like sit downs, right, between those who've, who have uh, had the police called on them and those who've made those calls. Sometimes you don't know who's made the call. Um, so we would have to have the mechanism to allow the victim of these incidents to confront uh, the person who made the call. Um, and oftentimes, research has shown that when someone is wronged, that they just want acknowledgment of that and that that is healing. The problem really is, though, what happens if the incident has escalated to a point where a mere apology would not be healing, where someone has been um, handled violently, um, hurt in some way, lost their lives, how do we then um, restore them or their families? Mm -hmm. So I'm, I, I'm sure that there is space for restorative justice. I have hope that there is space for restorative justice, but I don't quite know what it looks like. Great. Um, so our next question asks, what are your thoughts of a form of punishment being community service within the community that has been harmed by the false reporting? That can be helpful if the person doing the community service has uh, is given some pre-training before just being thrust into the community that they harmed. Um, that could be more harmful. Right? So you take someone who already acted out of fear, ignorance, and racial animus, and then you say, here, go and volunteer with these black kids. Uh, maybe not. Um, so I think there would have to be an education component um, that lasts longer than the actual service itself. Great. Uh, next question asks, does indigenous ideology around space as a more collective concept inform potential solutions that challenge the racialization of space? Give me that one again. Does indigenous ideology around space as a more collective concept inform potential solutions that challenge the racialization of space? Yes, I think so. Um, part of the problem or one of the many problems is the Western 
conceptualization of space itself as something that is individual and not collective, um, where the right to exclude is often paramount um, rather than um, an initiative to include. Um, so I think that indigenous notions of space being used and owned and uh, protected and stewarded collectively could be helpful in um, in transforming this this living while black uh, problem. Great. The questions are coming fast and furious now. Oh um, so what do you think law students, young attorneys specifically can do to decrease hashtag living while black incidents? Continue to educate yourself and others um, so that when you enter the legal profession, you are basically an evangelist for these ideas um, and someone who's who has taken the time to learn um, the history and the context of our laws and not just taking for granted that everything that is presented as race neutral actually is, um, to understand what are the foundations that underlie our systems and how those systems work and have worked in the past so that you can explain it to others and also incorporate it into your own work. Could you share what it looks like when we move away from incrementalism? Thank you. It looks like revolution. <laughs> um, I mean, that's that's the the answer, right? Is that it looks like the tearing down of structures that are no longer serving us, um, and the building of structures that do serve all of us. Great. Um, do you think the pre and post construction laws dealing with black folks as a whole, just as a just a mechanism for the continued use of the Willie Lynch syndrome, divided and conquer? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could you expound on the relationship of property law and nuisance, nuisance trespass laws? and holding private or public organizations accountable with regard to contributing to the false reporting that occurred in their property or with their employees? Yeah, I think that one thing that would be helpful is mandating that companies that's, that hold property as public accommodations um, train, properly train their employees on the policing, the proper policing of space um, and their own biases with regard to that. So we go back to the Starbucks incident. I used to, I've done so many things in Starbucks. I used to frequent them a lot and my friends who follow me on uh, Facebook know that there was a time when all I posted about was Starbucks and my various Starbucks names. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> And Dean is laughing because she's one of those people. Um, but I studied for the Louisiana bar in Starbucks, which included getting there in the morning, meeting up with my study partner, eating breakfast, leaving, coming back after lunch, taking a nap, and then starting to study again. Starbucks bills itself as a third space, as the, you know, the country's living room. So the idea that these guys, that these black men who were having a business meeting, that's why they were meeting there. They had a business enterprise that they wanted to enter into with one another. They were thinking of becoming business partners. People have business meetings in Starbucks all the time. Um, so it's important to, um, I, I think, for these companies that build themselves like Starbucks as a, as a third space or hotel lobbies, which are normally pretty open to anyone who's not being disruptive, um, that, they, that they train their uh, employees um, in a manner that will keep them from making these sorts of um, causing these sorts of incidents, and that if they don't have training programs in place, that there's some actual 
um, sanctions that the companies could face. So then if the, if the incidents still happen, well, the employee has not followed our procedures, they'll be dismissed, we'll deal with that in that way, but also that there are procedures in place and so that you can actually say that this employee is working outside of the way that we trained him or her. Great. Um, so speaking of Starbucks, Professor Erica George, um, who looks at corporate responsibility, um, says that Starbucks responded with to the hashtag living while black incident with training, and you've also written about Airbnb. What should responsible businesses be doing to assess and address and remedy these incidents? So the training can't be just a one-time thing. Right, so Starbucks train did their close everything May 2018. I don't know what else Starbucks has done. Maybe they've done more. I, I really don't know. I see Professor George is saying no there in the audience. So this has to be ongoing. Um, this can't be a one time thing. You can't just say, okay, we've done it. Now everything will be good. No, this is an ongoing process. Um, it's one in which continued education is necessary. And it's not just training white people with regard to black people. It's training black people with regard to Latinos. It's training, I mean, it's everything. It's training everyone, you know, straight people with regard to LGBTQ people. All of this training has to be ongoing so that everyone is ultimately included um, in spaces. So next, as students, how can we approach law through an ethnic studies lens in courses that don't address it? You can agitate for it. You have a voice. You can ask for it. You can form study groups of your own with your peers to learn more. And then you can ask questions of your professors. Oh, th this was really interesting, the reading uh, Professor X, but um, I was doing some outside reading and theorist Y says this, that, the other. How does that work with what, you're, what we're discussing today? You can do that. Yes, it takes more work, um, but again, part of your job as a learner isn't just to wait for someone to spe spoon feed something to you, but to actually go out and do some learning on your own. So that's part of what you can do. And um, for those of you who are interested in doing your own living or living and learning, um, uh, the American Association of Law Schools, the AALS, has um, an anti-racism clearinghouse, which was founded by uh, five black female deans who were fantastic. And as part of that clearinghouse, they specifically include rate, uh, resources for folk who are interested in educating themselves on these issues and further um, exploration. So again, that's the anti-racism clearinghouse um, at the American Association of Law Schools. And I, I certainly recommend it if you are interested in doing deeper reading. Um, so the next question asks, how can municipalities become involved in the healing process uh, for those who have been harmed? One of the ways that they can become involved, again, back to training, training their dispatchers, training their um, police um, organizations, but also recognizing when things go wrong and being transparent about that. Um, and then addressing those problems when and if they arise. Um, so I think that the best way, that that's one of the ways that municipalities can be, um, can be helpful in the healing process and can contribute to it. And along the lines of kind of healing and helping those who have been victimized, um, you talked about the harm on said person whom the police were called on. And so often we discuss the way retribution can be served, but how are we able to better uh, support the victims of these false claims? Again, through transparency, admitting when these things happen, um, seeking uh, restoration, including apologies, and um, having there be some consequences, right? And those consequences, again, don't have to be um, jail time, but they might include fines. It doesn't mean, just because 
we are speaking of restorative justice does not mean that there are no consequences. Um, there are still consequences. It's just a question of how those consequences are structured and whether they're structured in a way that ultimately helps the person who has also helps the person who has harmed to become a better citizen, a better person, a better neighbor. Great. And so we have one last question, which asks, racial, pre racial prejudice often spans across many racial divides and forms of bigotry, such as homophobia, homophobia and other races. How do we tackle bigotry as a whole? Is all bigotry toward black people an exclusive position for a bigot? I didn't hear the last part of this. Is all bigotry towards black people an exclusive position for a bigot? I don't quite understand the question. I'm sorry. Um, or how do, the, the first question asks, how do we tackle bigotry as a whole? Can we tackle it? Oh, God. Education and proximity. Um, we are a deeply segregated country. Um, and so part of it is that we don't know each other. Um, we know each other like in commercials, you see everybody's having a Coke and a smile together, but that doesn't actually exist. Um, neighborhoods are extremely segregated, which means schools, public schools are segregated. Um, we Churches are segregated. Dr. King used to say that what the 11 o'clock hour is the most segregated one in America. We don't spend time together. We don't know one another. So that is the main way I think we can break down barriers. Now, how do we get there? Um, we get there through restructuring these systems, right? Restructuring the systems that have ghettoized black and brown people into certain spaces um, that have kept them economically um, depressed. Um, and so as we reorder um, our systems, then we have more opportunities for proximity and um, community. And I think that that's the way to deal with the problem. Wonderful. Well, again, thank you so much for an amazing presentation. What for a phenomenal me. way to start the day. And thank you for your time and your wisdom. Thank you. Thank you.